convictions had a confession that was proven false by DNA evidence. You cannot believe your kid when he confesses because sometimes like Gerald Balt, he's saying, well, I must have done something. Other times he's saying, well, I was in the car with the guy who was driving it. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean he's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So lawyers in drug laboratories, I don't say anymore, right? Houston newspapers said it all about drug laboratories. So you can't even enter a plea of guilty unless you do this kind of investigation work, which clearly is not being done. Ellen talked about disposition, right? Disposition, even under the, uh, the uh, narrowest reading of Galt and McKeever and Shaw, dispositions is the heart and soul of juvenile court. So you would expect that lawyers do a lot of work at dispositions? Forget it. 73% of the lawyers in Maryland uh, encourage their clients to go directly from their plea of guilty to a disposition. No time in between to do any investigation, no time to do a study, no time to figure out why this kid is like this. 70% in North Carolina, 94% in Pennsylvania, 52% in every other state you want to talk to. In Virginia, the hearings are 10 minutes long, and that also includes the plea. And the answer is, we don't have the resources, number one, which is true. All these problems we're finding, there are no resources. Nobody can afford to hire investigators. Nobody can afford to hire experts. Reimbursements seldom come. In Texas and other states, if you want these people to testify in your case, you have to pay for them because the court is not going to pay. Right? Second is no training. No one gets training. State after state after state, no training. Um, Depressed yet? I can barely speak anymore about this. Um, <laughs> Post of this disposition is even worse. No one files appeals. You, know, you have lawyers who practice their whole lives without filing appeals in this case. A lot of lawyers think their appointment ends at disposition. They don't even go see the kid afterwards because they think their job is done. And indeed, in most states, even if they think they still have job to do, a job to do, they aren't going to get paid for it. If you're in a rural state where the detention center is 100 miles away from where the kid was convicted, are you going to take that 100 miles, drive that 100 miles two ways, talk to your kid without getting paid? You know, people are in this business to make a living. We're not in this business to be as poor as our clients, right? We deserve to be paid like anybody else. So lack of resources is a key. Lack of training is a key. And worse is caseloads. Just listen to these numbers. The ABA, by the way, recommends about 200 cases per year, right? Maryland, per year? Per year. Per year. That's both pre-trial and post-trial. Uh, and that's a pretty generally accepted, uh, accepted rule. In Maryland, 360 cases. Pennsylvania, 620 cases. Louisiana, 800 to 1,000 cases. Um, Washington, 360 to 750 cases. Virginia, no caps on the number of people represented. And when you include your civil cases and the other adult cases you're doing, maybe as much as 1,500 cases. Three a day, right? Is that right? It's five a day. I know it's not very good. Georgia, 900 cases. And it goes on and on and on. So how do we fix this? You know, is this is this what's really going on? And the answer is yes. This is what's really going on. And we suspect, based on uh, our National Juvenile Defender Center summits and other conversations we have with other people around the country, that when we do those assessments in those other 36 states, we are going to see a different picture. We're going to see somewhat better representation in the cities where people are looking a little bit more. But once you cross the street from Philadelphia into everything west, you aren't going to get anything better than what I've been talking about here. Um, now, very sad. Sometimes I like to call this paper, I call the article, Prophets of Wheel, Prophets of Woe, right? <laughs> Here's Justice Fortas, the prophet of wheel. Here's Wally Millett, the prophet of woe. <laughs> But things are happening, right? These assessments surprisingly have taken states uh, aback. They cannot believe what was going on in their own states. And so some good things are happening. Um, let me move to the good things quickly. In at least 13 of the states that have been assessed so far, uh, the states have formed commissions to look into this. Now, we all know things die in commissions. But in fact, there's been significant legislation in Georgia, Louisiana, and Mississippi to change the entire culture of juvenile defenders. The state of Washington just voluntarily agreed to change the numbers of cases in their caseloads. 
Um, other states have had smaller statutory uh, changes which have provided for increases in salaries and increases in resources. I don't know if you know this, but in probably every state in the union, if you are a prosecutor, you make X dollars. If you are a defender, you make X minus, often X minus 50%. Defenders and prosecutors do not pay the same amount of money. Isn't that strange? Well, it's strange sort of backwards because prosecutors are all these people who work for them, right? I have to work for myself and get a half the money. Uh, new clinical programs have started up in Florida and in Virginia and in Maine. It's a very good thing. Statewide public defender offices are getting influxes of money in these states. Performance standards and training programs are both being funded and being required in several of these states now as a result of the uh, assessments. And finally, at least in four states, the ability to waive counsel has been restricted in some form. Not completely, but in some form. So here's the message. Who's at, who's at fault? Well, you know, we're probably all at fault. I talk to all these criminal defense lawyers that I work with all the time that work in the adult court, and I say, this is the 40th anniversary of Gerald Galt, and they say, who? Because juvenile court is off everybody's radar. It is only on the radar of those of us who gather here to lament the sorry state of juvenile justice. Judges probably bear the, the biggest blame because they're the ones who are the point. They see it every day. They know what's going on, and they're doing nothing about it. They're probably encouraging the continuation of that kind of a system, but it's really time to stop it. Uh, as Ellen mentioned, we, uh, we have all, over the last five or six years, Gerald Gall is now an honorary member of our uh, National Juvenile Defender Center Board. Uh, we've all gotten to know Jerry very well. And uh, Jerry himself has dedicated his life, the remainder of his life, to do this work. Uh, his life is interesting. He was uh, in the Army. He uh, now is a heavy equipment operator. He comes to conferences all over the country on his own dime. His own job. Sometimes you pay him, but at least on his own time. He has to take time off of work to do this. Forty years have passed. It's long enough, right? Long enough. Way too long. Uh, Jerry's dedicated himself to this, and we have to explore. Thank you. Philadelphia. He is an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychology 